one I wanted to get out was just preparing for fall because really fall is here. Um, if you're around any of the redwoods like I am, you see them all starting to senesce their old growth and drop it and make a mess everywhere. Uh, so if any of you guys are working with redwood trees, odds are you're starting to get that phone call of my redwood trees dying. It's not, does this every year right about this time. Uh, so I want to just start by really quickly um, introducing myself, Dawn Fluharty with Arborjet. Gosh, I've been with Arborjet for almost 10 years now. Been in this industry for over 17 years. Um, so been a, been a long haul at some of this, staring at trees, figuring out problems. So feel free to use me as a resource. That, that's what I'm here to be. Um, if you have any questions you run into, issues you're having, by all means, reach out. Uh, I can kind of help you identify what might be going on. And I am a PCA. Uh, so if you need a recommendation, I, I can do that as well. But keep in mind, I really don't like writing reports. <laughs> So that being said, that's a little brief history on me and all the different associations I'm currently working with. But let's let's get into the heart of the matter here. And let's start talking about uh, pests and diseases we tend to treat in the fall. Um, and when I talk about meeting we treat in fall, as in the applications really should be done now up until about Thanksgiving. That's what we call fall. Usually we say the beginning of September, once our hot, hot temperatures break, out to the, the beginning uh, or just before uh, Thanksgiving. And the reason why we say that is because we have to make sure we give the trees enough time to really react to whatever applications we're doing before they completely go dormant uh, or you know during the winter time. So first and foremost, and I, I, I can bring it up because everyone else is talking about it at this point too, just because of all the fires, are our bark beetles. Uh, the Western bark beetle is most prominent for us uh, this one we find in our urban landscape. We really find it up in our mountains. It's throughout northern and southern and central California. Uh, so this is one of the main beetles we actually work with. Uh, this be beetle in particular um, is what we call a tree killer in the fact that once this beetle starts to attack a tree um, and lay its brood and the brood makes the galleries underneath the bark, um, it pretty much girdles the vascular tissue of the tree. The tree can't uptake water and the tree dies. And when this pest particularly attacks, um, it kind of uh, does it in mass in the fact that you get a couple hits, just got a couple hits, odds are there's not that much vascular damage. We can still do a systemic application and protect the tree. But when you have mass attacks and they've totally disrupted that vascular tissue, we can't save it. And that's part of the why when we see trees that have died from this beetle or mountain pine beetle, we get that torched red and dead effect where all of a sudden the tree was green and all of a sudden turns pretty much red all at the same time. And, and that is just because of the way that they girdle the vascular tissue and make it so the tree can no longer get water. So it's a really good identifier if you have this particular pest um, that that is, that is what you're looking to deal with. And I did mention the mountain pine beetle Mountain pine beetle we do have in some areas as well. Uh, more so uh, in the kind of Sierras and kind of Northern California. We don't have this one throughout California. Uh, and so I kind of talk more about the Western, but they're very similar in their appearance. They're similar in their attack style uh, and uh, they're not quite similar in their galleries, but um, the way we treat them is the same. In this case, we always treat for that beetle with the emmectin benzoate, the triage products. Uh, that will protect the tree for two years. We do it in the fall because we want to have time for that chemical to get into the tree and circulate throughout the tree before that beetle's flying next spring. And a lot of times people will say, well, I like to do spring applications. It goes in the tree better. Yes, it, it does technically go in the tree a little bit better. Um, but the problem is the beetles are flying, flying in spring and triage will take a good five weeks to circulate throughout a tree. So at that point, you're playing this game of the chemicals racing the tree, the beetles are attacking, who's gonna win? Um, so that's why we really like to do all of our bark beetle applications in the fall. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of imperative right now, especially uh, this past year, we saw the beetles flying as early as uh, February. And so that being said, it really doesn't give us enough time out in spring to do the applications uh, to get it in the tree in a timely manner before the beetle starts attacking. So that's the reason why this is one of the number one things and applications I advocate for in fall. Is if you are going to be trying to go after bark beetles, 
do it in the fall, get that tree protected before spring, and that way you don't have to worry about uh, potential attacks when the tree is not yet protected, though you've treated it. There's no call worse than the call of, hey, you just treated my tree, and it died a couple weeks later from attacks. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Uh, fall is the best time to do it. Uh, we also talk about treating with uh, propozole because we've now seen the western pine beetle uh, as well as the mountain pine beetle vectoring the blue stain fungus. So the blue stain fungus is a disease that they bring in and introduce under the tree. And it's not nearly as virulent as the blue stain fungus we've seen over in Colorado, which that blue stain will just outright kill a tree. Um, here it, it, it can kill a tree, but it's a much slower process and seems to take a lot longer. And we've had much better results uh, of propozole uh, protecting the tree from that particular disease. So if you're going to be doing your applications, a lot of times we say go ahead and uh, do both applications at the same time, both the triage and the propozole, to protect the tree from the beetle as well as from that fun fungus it might vector in. So any, if you guys have any questions, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, feel free, type them into the chat. When we get to the end, I'll go through all the questions and, and answer them so uh, you can get any questions you might have answered. Uh, Ips and graver beetle, that's the other most common boring beetle we really have on our conifers. Um, I would actually argue that this is even more common than western mountain or any of the other beetle combined. And it, it's just because uh, this little beetle usually attacks from the top of the tree. He tends to get overlooked. Um, you might see a dead branch in the tree and think, oh, you know, it's wind damage or, you know, maybe an animal or something broke it. Um, but really, it, it, odds are it's probably these little guys. Um, it's Ips and Graver beetle are throughout California in very high populations, and they don't tend to attack and kill the whole tree. But what we tend to see is they like to attack the top third of the tree. We refer to these guys as the tip ip. Um, and you'll usually see a branch or two die, and then sometimes you'll just see the top of the tree die. You're like, huh, the top of my tree died. Odds are it's this little guy right here. Um, and, and so what ends up happening is, is they stress a tree. And so then we start seeing the other beetles like mountain pine beetle and western pine beetle and turpentine beetles uh, start to come into the tree. So it's really important once you see this beetle starting to attack a tree, that is your sign to go out and protect that tree. It's actually very easy to protect trees from the engraver beetle because their damage is quite a bit smaller and they tend to um, attack branches or branch bases. And, and so we'll see visually the damage that has occurred um, without it actually fully attacking and girdling the whole tree. So that way we have that chance to get in there and do that application. So again, we use the triage products on this particular beetle and we want to do it in the fall. I know I, I keep talking about the fall applications and, and I've had a number of people argue with me that spring is so much easier to get it into the tree. Um, but really uh, that extra, you know, 15 minutes it takes you to get it in during the fall is well worth the effort to make sure that tree is protected come spring when all these beetles start flying. So uh, this one at this point in time is not known to really vector too much of the diseases. Um, it, it has a couple that it'll carry. And so anytime we treat for bark beetles, we are almost always adding in that propozole. Um, so I'll talk about pitch canker here in a minute because that is one of the uh, diseases this one can vector. So anytime we're doing these applications in fall, you definitely want to work on doing your applications with both the insecticide and the fungicide of propozole. Okay, I mentioned red turpentine beetle. And that's because this one is also throughout California. It only attacks the bottom three feet of the tree. So this one's completely different. It's actually quite a bit of a larger beetle. You can see the coloring is kind of a purplish brown. And when it actually bores into the tree, it leaves a very large pitch tube. But I'm gonna say it's almost the size of a softball or a baseball sometimes. Um, and that is the real indicator. If you see any of these big, large pitch masses in the bottom three feet, odds are you have the red turpentine beetle. Uh, they're throughout the Monterey area. We have them up in the Sierras. I haven't seen too much really up towards Grass Valley Tahoe, uh, but then again, I've seen them down in Southern California as well. So keep your eye out for this one. This one is larger. It actually does quite a bit more damage. And since it's attacking in a condensed area on the tree, it has a much greater likelihood of killing that tree faster um, by that, that girdling and damaging effect that they have in, inside that vascular tissue. So the trick with treating with this one, aside from doing it in fall, is also the 
getting kind of below the soil line of the tree. Because as you can see in these attack sites, they're very low. They're pretty much almost at the soil line. So you almost have to excavate a tiny bit to get down below where the attack sites are and do your applications of the triage because that way it's gonna go up and protect. If you're waiting for the whole movement throughout the entire tree, it's gonna take a lot longer. So that's why we say try and get below where they're attacking so you can get immediate protection as the chemical moves up the vascular tissue of the tree. And this one in particular, uh, it has been noted that they rarely kill trees on their own. So odds are your tree was probably already stressed or under attack from something else that really attracted in this beetle. So that being said, uh, keep your eyes open. If you now notice you have red turpentine beetles, your tree is probably severely stressed um, and you should be evaluating whether you can really save and protect it. Um, that, that is one of the tricks when I start seeing these beetles attack the tree is if I can still get that vascular tissue to function for me and move the chemical. Um, if it can, by all means, I inject and protect that tree. Um, but sometimes when you see too many pitch masses, too much decline in canopy, you know there's no way you can save the tree uh, and it should be a, a removal as soon as possible and chipping or at least debarking so that way there's no chance of the larvae surviving in the tree uh, while it's while it's felled. Okay so the one thing I will mention and I, I, I don't know how many of you guys have heard about the new triage R10. You guys heard about our original triage and then we came out with a triage G4 which became a general use one with a caution label that was great, especially for city work. Um, but now we've come out with triage R10, which is excellent for conifer work. And the reason I is the R10 um, has twice the concentration, which means we get to put in half the dose inside the tree. And if any of you guys have ever injected a conifer, you know they're difficult to inject. So the smaller dose we can get in, the better. Um, so this one is also federally restricted, so keep that in mind. Applicator has to purchase it. Applicator has to be on site when using it. But the other great aspect of this product is the fact that you can mix it directly with propozole. So if you are going to be treating, you know, against the blue stain fungus or pitch canker, you can literally mix the triage and the propozole together in one bottle and inject it one time into the tree. So keep that in mind. R10 is now available in California. And if you're working with conifers, I highly, highly recommend it. Okay, so, huh, my title got messed up. Well, that's supposed to say pitch canker. Um, not sure what happened there, but at least the power is still on. So anyway, this slide is for pitch canker. Um, so this is why I was telling you that the smaller Ips beetles have a tendency of being more apt to vector than say something like blue stain. Um, and this one in particular has been now moving throughout California. We originally just saw pitch canker in kind of Monterey on the Monterey Pines. Um, and now we found that it'll actually go into Bishop Pines. Uh, a couple other different types of pines we're looking at as well now. And um, once a tree has it, it's kind of like a messy weeding death. That's usually what gets people's attention is all the sap and, and, and pitch that's just weeping everywhere. And so that being said, um, we can actually protect trees from this disease. But a lot of times you have to stop the vector as well. So make sure all the weeping and sapping and sometimes you'll notice the tips failing. You'll see that, that the tip bend because it's basically it's, it's clogging up the vascular tissue and the tips are now dying out. Um, inject with the triage, stop the vectoring beetles, and then inject with the propozole and that will help uh, suppress the disease. And you can actually get these trees to actually rebound and outgrow it over time. I have noticed though, when treating this, it usually takes a couple applications. Um, mind you, you're doing the applications every two years. So it's over about a four year period that you can really get these uh, to look better and, and start to recover. So keep that in mind, another good option for mixing that R10 and propozole for this application. All right. The other one that is a bore that we want to treat in the fall uh, is the one attacking our walnuts, specifically our black walnuts. And the reason why we really want to treat for this one in the fall uh, is actually because the tree is pretty um, phytotoxic to the propozole material that we use. So the problem with this particular pest, the walnut twig beetle, is like most uh, beetles, it attacks in mass and uh, it moves very quickly. So unfortunately, you see the tree on the right, you see those couple top dead branches. 
you would see that in almost six months later, you would see the, almost the majority of the tree declining. And that's just because of the attacking of the pest and the pest vectoring in uh, the disease, which is what they refer to as thousand cankers. It's actually another geosmithia. But the whole idea is the fungal infection is not terribly large. But when you get all those thousands of hits and attacks and everything else, you get all these little cankers showing up on the tree, at which point it makes one giant canker, starts to girdle branches, and if it gets into the main trunk, it'll girdle the main trunk and kill the tree. So uh, with that, we go after the beetle, of course, with the triage product, but we use the propozole uh, to go after the geosmithia. Um, and keep in mind, on the propozole label, the geosmithia is actually on the 2EE expanded label. So make sure if you're going to be treating for this, you print out that 2EE label off our website and take it with you. So that way you're compliant if anyone stops you. But uh, we have found that uh, walnut trees are sensitive to the propozole. So we do get some burning on the leaf margins. So the reason why we do in the fall is because they're already starting to turn their leaves and senesce and drop them. So if we do create a little marginal burning on there, it's, it's not an issue. Uh, it's not an aesthetic issue. Um, the tree will re-leaf out beautifully uh, come spring without any further damage. So the only issue I do kind of have with this one is really once you identify it, you should be treating. And for some reason, we always identify it when the tree is trying to pull the most water. So that's during our summer months, our hottest months. Um, if you go out and do the triage and the propozole application in a hot month like August, odds are you are going to cause some leaf drop. So just be aware of that. Um, it's best to do this one in fall if you can. Um, however, I wouldn't be waiting too long to do these applications because you're starting to play that game of if I wait too long, I might lose the tree. How bad is it to burn a couple leaves? Yeah, it, it's, it's a fun game, but no customer ever wants to see their leaves burnt off the tree. So you kind of have to play that uh, balancing act and walk that fine line. Okay, bronze birch borer is the other one uh, that we've been doing a lot of fall applications on. And the reason why we've been doing the fall applications on this one is because people have been doing uh, soil drenches of imidacloprid uh, as kind of a preventative application for this particular pest. And what's happening is we'll see those applications usually doing early spring. That's when we usually do our merit or metacloprid soil drenches. Well, they don't really make it through an entire year, unfortunately. And so what happens is, is by fall, all of a sudden we see this pest starting to make a real push. And so the soil drench has already been done, not being terribly effective at this point. So do you soil drench again in fall? No, we tend to go in for the trunk injection in fall. And so you can use the imidacloprid, but keep in mind it's only going to protect the tree for one year. Um, and I don't really recommend it once you have um, uh, what I call a lethal infestation, meaning say you have three trees, one of them's already died, you really need to bump it up to the, the triage, the emmec and benzoate. It's much more effective against the larvae and the adults than just imidacloprid. So that being said, uh, if it comes fall and you've already had one tree die, the soil drench didn't stave off the uh, infestation, you should probably inject with the triage at that point. Um, if you find that you're just uh, not getting as much control as you want after your soil drench in spring, uh, some people just switch to a fall application of trunk injection. And some of this guy stems from the, the, the whole uh, limiting factor on the label of how much uh, neonic you can apply in, a, in an acre. So if someone has a number of trees and they've already done the soil drench, they've already hit how much they can apply, that's when we see a lot of people switching over to trunk injection of imidacloprid. But honestly, if you're going to be taking the time to drill, plug, and inject, uh, you're really better off doing the triage because uh, then it's going to protect you for at least two years and you're not have to go back and reapply. So that, that's, that's my methodology when dealing with the bronze bridge borer, but that's why it's one of those pests that we tend to treat in the fall. Okay, aphids, I had to throw it in here. If you're going to be treating for aphids in the fall, odds are you're doing it because you're getting ahead of your work come spring. So uh, that being said, imidacloprid will protect uh, the, the, the tree for an entire year. So if you inject it in the fall, it's going to be protected till the next fall. Um, we can also use your ACE jet or your azosol, but they don't protect for an entire year. So those are more spring options, not something you want to be necessarily doing in the fall. So if you are trying to get ahead of it, a tree that you know is always getting infested and you just want to get it off your work list for spring, get ahead of it. Use the imidacloprid, it'll protect that tree for an entire year. And then mites. The reason why I bring up mites as a fall application 
is because we have been seeing an incredible population of mites this year, from conifer mites to oaks to olives. Mites have been a severe issue. Um, and the problem is, is when we see mites, it's because they've already done quite a bit of damage. They're stippling, we see webbing, the, the tree is declining. And that's when we go in with that ace jet and just knock them out. You inject the ace jet, it usually knocks the, knocks the mites out in about 24 to 48 hours. Um, but it doesn't have the residual. Ace jet only lasts, you know, maybe 60 days in the tree. So that being said, fall is when we use the triage product. Uh, triage will work on mites, but again, it takes that good kind of five weeks or so to circulate throughout the tree. So if we get ahead of when the mites are gonna be feeding and populating, that's when we use triage, that's when we do our fall applications. So if you had had a horrible mite outbreak this year, and know you have a stand of trees that are infested, by all means, go in this fall, inject with the triage, it's going to protect uh, that tree from the, the mite infestation coming this, this coming year. So that's why I say it. I don't recommend usually doing triage without ace jet in the spring, because you want to stop the feeding and the damage as quick as possible. So if you wait till spring, start with the ace jet, fall right behind with the injection of the triage behind it so you don't have to keep coming back and redoing it. So fall applications to prevent mites, you definitely wanna work with the triage product. You don't have to use the ace jet in fall. Okay, and then our eucalyptus trees. I should have put this under the tree category. Um, but uh, the thing with eucalyptus trees is we now have kind of a myriad of pests that attack them. Uh, we're all familiar with the lerpsilid there on the left. And we've all seen the notching caused by the tortoise beetle. Um, but we also have the bronzing bug in Southern California. And of course, we have the longhorn borer uh, that will also attack the trees. We can use ace jet on these trees and knock the pests out very quickly. But again, it doesn't have that longevity. So I tend to say use ace jet in the spring when you have a big population flush to knock them down quickly. But for fall applications, I tend to recommend the imidacloprid. And the reason is timing. Uh, our eucalyptus trees tend to want to bloom in spring, and we try to use, avoid using any sort of neonics in spring. So I have played this game over and over where I've had like a line of 20 eucalyptus trees, and I want to do my spring application, and I'm waiting for them to all finish their flowering, and there's like three holdout trees who just can't seem to flower with the rest of them. So it messes with the scheduling. So I prefer to do my eucalyptus applications in the fall. That way I don't have to worry about flowering as an issue. I can get the product inside the tree. When the pests start feeding come spring, I know the trees are protected. So that's why I tend to do all my applications in fall for my eucalyptus trees. And the imidacloprid will take out all the pests that attack eucalyptus trees. So it's a really kind of one and done application. So that's my plug for eucalyptus trees. I know most people don't treat their eucalyptus trees. Someday, someday I'll get everybody treating the eucalyptus trees. So, uh, the other fall application we do is for anthracnose. So anthracnose uh, has been a problem uh, for the last couple of years. And if it's been a sycamore, it's been a problem for its entire life. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> we just have severe anthracnose infections in our sycamores to the point where it's in the leaf, it's in the twig material. Um, and, and we've just gotten used to seeing it. I get more calls for anthracnose on oaks, ash, and elm because it's an anomaly. They're like, hey, there's something wrong with my tree. So then we, we tend to treat more for that at this point, which is kind of sad. But if you're dealing with anthracnose in a uh, Western sycamore, you want to use phosphajet. And the reason that is, is because phosphajet gets the anthracnose as well as Botrysphaeria canker, which has a tendency of wanting to infest uh, sycamore trees as well. So it's a dual application, but you have to do it in fall because phosphajet stimulates the tree's own immune system. So if you don't give that tree enough time to react and protect itself through the fall and winter months, come spring when it leaves out, it's, it's not gonna be protected and you're not gonna see uh, that reduced effect you're gonna see with uh, a proper timing of your application. So again, fall, pretty much September 1, before, until before Thanksgiving. If you go after Thanksgiving and we get an early spring, odds are your, your tree won't be protected. The tree hasn't had enough time to really stimulate its own immune system. So not quite the same when we're dealing with ash, oak, and elm anthracnose. Uh, we actually use propozole. So we do still prefer a fall application. Um, I've seen a lot of people push those applications into spring. Um, you can, but if you push it too late, you, you will see a reduced effect uh, of the product. 
So I recommend if you're going after any sort of anthracnose, do it in the fall. Um, and especially it's one of those situations where if you had it the prior year, you had an ash tree where you noticed it, but you pretty much noticed it when it's too late to really do anything about it. Um, make sure you circle back around and do that application this fall and get it protected for next year. So uh, we do that with propozole, like I said, on our oak, ash, and elm. Okay, so the reason why I have a scale sheet up here is actually mainly just for this culprit right down here, sycamore scale. So the reason is, is because back here when we're doing anthracnose and we're treating our ash trees, at the same time, treat for the sycamore scale. Um, unfortunately, the sycamore scale has been misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed for probably the last five years at least, maybe longer. We're just starting to really get good awareness on it. Um, and so unfortunately, most sycamore trees have sycamore leaf scale, um, and it really hurts uh, the tree's overall health and adds to the leaf senescence in the summer months. So uh, we use imidacloprid for that. So feel free to team it up with your anthracnose treatment um, and treat in the fall. Uh, you just inject the phosphojet, change the chemical in the unit, and inject the uh, imidacloprid right behind it. And then you can take care of both issues and have the tree nice and cleaned up come spring. Okay. So I talk about trees that we treat for in fall, and our first and foremost is oak trees. We try not to do any sort of oak tree treatments, especially not during the summer months, but we really try to do all of our applications starting October 1 and going pretty much through the end of March. That's kind of our, our window of when we want to be messing with our oak trees. And so that being said, um, a lot of our pests that we deal with come out in spring, um, or late spring, kind of early summer. And so that, that's an issue for us having to treat them, right? We, we want to treat them when they're right there because that's when the customer usually calls. But some of these pests like oakworm and tussock moth, we pretty much know when they're coming. Um, sometimes we can see the cocoons on the trees like we see with tussock moth. Sometimes we just see the repeat attacks from the oakworm. And so we kind of know which trees need protecting and, and which ones need to be, uh, have a chemical applied to. And so that being said, fall is the time to treat for oak worm and tussock moth. I know it's kind of outside the norm, but the thing is, is when we use the triage product, that works for anything that forages in the tree or physically eats the leaves. And these two guys physically eat the leaves. So with that, it's very important that we get this product in, in ample time to circulate through the entire tree. So when these do hatch and start feeding, the chemical is already there and the tree is protected. So that's why in fall, we try to treat for this and we just put in the triage. Um, if you get the call in spring and these guys are already out and feeding, you got to lead with the ace jet. The ace jet will knock them out immediately, so you stop that feeding pressure. But if you're going to take the time to do that, then just swap the chemical in the bottle, inject the triage right behind it, and then get that tree protected for a couple of years. So these are a couple of pests. I see the oak worm more out on the coast. Um, we see multiple life cycles on this one, so it can really defoliate and harm our trees. So therefore, I really advocate treating for the oakworm. Tussock moth, they're not quite as voracious. We tend to find them a little more inland in warmer areas. Uh, but the problem with the tussock uh, moth in particular is you see all those little fine hairs on there. Uh, they actually create horrible allergic reactions for a lot of people. So when they show up in our parks or public areas, uh, it's very important that we reduce those populations so we don't have that irritant for the public. So that's why I see a lot of people treating for the tussock moth. But it's best if you don't treat right when they're there feeding. It's best if you can get ahead and do these treatments in the fall. And it's, it's simple. It's a one and done with triage and you're protected. So keep that in mind. I'm going to go through a list of oak problems now since oak is one of the key trees we should be treating in the fall. So uh, don't laugh at this one too hard. We all know oak trees get white fly, right? It's standard. We see all these little uh, black and white little nymphal stays on the side of the leaves. Uh, if you shake the tree after they've grown to adults, you see this puff of white cloud. Um, how many of you guys have actually seen thrips now showing up on your oak trees? Uh, this is something, maybe they ran out of myoporms. I don't know. Uh, maybe they're jumping from the ficus. Can't tell you. Uh, but we've seen a real influx of thrips hitting our oak trees as well. So be aware of it. You can see that kind of stippling, the feeding effect from the thrips. Um, take a closer look. You'll, you'll notice a lot more of that uh, on the top of the leaf on the oaks. Um, so nice part is imidacloprid takes care of both white fly and thrips. And again, 
try and do it in the fall. Reason being is it's gonna protect that tree for the entire year, but it also stops that population from growing out of control in spring while you're waiting for your chemical to get through the tree. So once you inject imidacloprid, usually it takes about 10 to 14 days to really start spreading throughout the tree and affect, affecting the pests. Um, and then, like I said, the residuals for about a year and you'll be protected till the following fall. So it's a great way to get rid of these mobile pests. Um, the only thing I'll say on using imidacloprid uh, to go after these guys is you have to make sure you have the good full dose rate inside the tree. Uh, being a mobile pest, they fly around, they feed small amounts here and there. If you don't have the full dose in the tree, you're not going to get full complete coverage and all of a sudden you don't get complete control of the pest. And that's what we really see happening with soil drenches. Uh, we can do the applications, they don't quite last, we don't have enough residual in the plant material for it to really affect the pests. So pay attention to the label, look at the label, make sure you're getting the correct dose in the tree. But keep in mind, we do prune all of our trees. So uh, that's why we have a lot of that wiggle room for medium and low rates and, and doing your applications. If you had a tree that's been severely pollarded, then by all means, cut back your dose. If you have an oak tree that's in a rangeland that's barely ever seen a pruning shear, by all means, you should be going at that high rate dose. Okay, and then we have the oak twig girdler. This is another one we treat for in fall. This one, right now you can see the damage. Uh, if you see branches, little small branches dead on your oak tree, and you go up to the branch and you look at it, you'll see a small hole somewhere on that branch. And that small hole is being caused by this uh, twig girdler. And essentially the larvae goes into the heart tissue, heartwood tissue inside that branch. These guys only have a like, two year life cycle. So we don't really see them continuously attacking like we do with some pests. But as you've noticed, their populations have gotten so high, it looks like we almost have a continuous uh, attack period at this point in time. So uh, triage will work against this pest. It's a boring pest uh, and it'll protect that tree and it, nice part is it runs the lifespan of the pest. Uh, so you can really kind of do almost a one and done on a tree to really kind of wipe out this infestation on a tree. Um, keep in mind, there are a couple diseases that look very similar uh, to the twig girdler where you get kind of get that branch dieback. So it's really important that when you see little dead branches and clumps on the tree, go in, look close. If you see that little initial entry site, that, that's going to be this guy. And we've now seen him pretty much throughout the Bay Area, Central California, and now into Southern California. So look close. Uh, this one in particular, he's kind of like Mother Nature's natural pruning device. Um, but unfortunately, with our trees being under such stress, uh, just from drought and other pests and diseases, uh, it can do quite a bit of harm to these trees. So by all means, reduce the pressure, treat with triage, and you can take care of some of the other pests that are also attacking our poor oak trees, such as the western oak bark beetle. So this one is also throughout California. It is a native beetle. So we don't tend to raise too many alarm flags when we see this guy. Our oaks are kind of used to battling them. Um, it just, their populations increase when we get into drought. And we're, we're still fighting off a very large population from the last large drought we had. And then now with Northern California kind of being in another drought, this beetle is just thriving. Um, so look for this guy. Odds are you probably won't see him. You'll just see the damage he's doing because he's now vectoring a disease in some cases. Not all cases. I have still seen trees where he's not carrying the disease. He's doing his little bit of damage. It's not an issue. It's when he brings in this disease of foamy bark canker disease that it really becomes the issue. Um, Cause it's a disease that actually gets in and girdles the vascular tissue. So when we're treating for this, we use the triage for the beetle. And on the label, we have this geosmithia disease on the propozole two double E label. So remember I mentioned that, pull that two double E label to get the full uh, listing of pests that can be treated by propozole. But it's this girdling effect of the vascular tissue is what that disease is doing and it's just killing the trees. And it's pretty quick. Uh, so you might start seeing a dead tree here or there, you'll take a look, all of a sudden you'll see all these attack sites with some sort of weeping or foaminess to them. Um, and you'll start to look throughout the stand and you'll see it spread pretty far. So remove the one that can no longer be saved that's already got this girdling effect that's already dying out. Chip it, don't remove it from the site, try and solarize it right there on the site, keep it away from the other oaks, but solarize it and chip it. Um, and then treat the remaining trees in the area with the, the triage propozole combination.
Okay, the other one hitting our oak trees that we treat for in fall is gold spotted oak borer. So far, Southern California is the only lucky winner who gets to be dealing with this one, but it is probably just one fire truckload of wood away from making it to Northern California and to other areas. So this one did come to us from Arizona. Thank you, Arizona. And uh, this one has been quite detrimental in Southern California to our kind of rangeland oaks. So oaks that aren't necessarily in our urban environment, but right on that edge. And so unfortunately it is a tree killer. We don't usually see the pest itself. It tends to want to hide up in the canopy. So we don't really go by this whole six gold spots on its back as a good identifier. We identify by the D-shaped exit holes. So it's a flathead bore. So when it comes out of the tree, you have that flat edge and the rounded side uh, of how it comes out. So you can very clearly see we had a flathead bore in the tree. And unfortunately, this one does go in. It does make galleries under the bark. It does cause a girdling uh, or disruption to the xylem and phloem. And that's usually what kills the tree. So it's one of those things you'll see a whole tree kind of die out and a lot of leaves will hang on just because it's that dried of like an instant drought type situation. Almost kind of like what we see happening with our conifers and bark beetle attacks. So this one, right now we have it documented in our live oaks, our canyon oaks, uh, our black oaks. Uh, there's a couple more oaks that they're looking at that we think we've identified them in. It seems like as they move further outside their native range of Arizona, they're widening their breadth of oak trees they're willing to attack, which is not good news for us. So you can use, because it's a flathead bore, the imidacloprid, the imaget. Remember, it'll only last one year in the tree. Um, and you can also use the triage uh, against this in the last two years in the tree. So we are still working to finalize our research on the triage on this guy. Uh, we keep getting stymied every time and we thought for sure we we're gonna get this all settled and then COVID happened and we couldn't get back to pull our research. So <laughs> this is just one of those things where we we're having a hard time with the research on the triage. Uh, but because it works very well on other flathead borers, uh, we're confident it's gonna work very well on the gold spotted oak borer as well. So, and we know our oak trees can get that nasty invasive shot hole borer. So this is another one you wanna do as a treatment in fall. Um, honestly, with the way this pest reproduces, if you actually identify it in your oak tree, you really should be treating it right then and there. Um, but if you're doing it preventatively, fall is your time to do the applications. So for instance, say you have a property that your sycamores are being attacked by the invasive shot hole borer. Look around, see if there's any specimen oaks that you know you wanna save. And by all means, this fall, go out, do the injection. Since it's just preventative, you can get away with just using the triage product. Um, as long as there's no attacks on the tree and the pest has not yet introduced its fungus, you can get away with just using the insecticide of triage to protect the tree. So if you're going out preventively in the fall for your oaks, by all means, just use a triage. If the tree has already gotten a few attacks on it and it's vectored in this fusarium, then we really do need to add in the propozole. So um, it, it's one of those things, the propozole itself is, is effective against the fungus, and that's mainly what the pests are feeding on. So we use the insecticide to kill the pest to get it, to prevent it from going in and setting up its fungal uh, food source. Um, once it's already in there, we have to attack the food source as well. So if you do get attacks, you have to use both the insecticide and the fungicide. And by doing it in fall, you're staying ahead of it. We see our big peak flights usually around April, and then this year, we normally see them around October, but uh, I've just been on two different sites where their brood are in the tree and ready to come out. So we're in a window of probably another two to three weeks at most, and we should see the flight happening again. So that's usually the flight we see in the, in the fall season. So keep your eye out for this one. Uh, make sure if there's any trees you need to protect, they're protected. Um, and uh, if you have any questions on this one, please don't hesitate to send any questions. Uh, we're still working with uh, Dr. Escalon, who's now at UC Davis, um, and he's working on tracking a couple of sites we have here in the Bay Area as well right now. Okay, and then of course, for our oak trees, there's sudden oak death. So sudden oak death, right now, it's mainly in the Bay Area. It's gotten a little bit up into Northern California, and as far down as San Luis Obispo, County, um, it does have the potential to move throughout the state. And when it does, uh, honestly, this is a distinct tree killer, mainly of tan oaks. Um, it spreads better when it has the, the vectoring plant material of, of uh, bay trees, uh, but also, you know, things in the rhododendron family can also help. Zaleas, rhodes, uh, they can also help vector this disease. 
So just because you don't have a bay tree on your property or near your property doesn't mean you're safe from sudden oak death. Just means you have a less likely chance of getting it. Um, but it can be vectored in. So pay attention. If you notice any cankers or bleeding or weeping, usually in the bottom third of the trunk, um, look a little bit closer. Uh, it could be your standard Phytophthora infection or it, it could be uh, the Phytophthora uh, P. remorum, so it's a sudden oak death. So look at the leaves. You usually kind of get a watermarking or fading of the leaves. Um, sometimes they call them water spotting. Um, but the real indicator a lot of times is you'll start to see the dead branches, you'll start to see the cankering, and at that point the tree is truly infected. It's really hard to save it. Even with trunk injection, you only have about a 25% chance of actually saving that tree. Um, and trunk injection puts the full dose right into that vascular tissue. It's the most effective way. So that's the reason why they say with trunk injection, you can do an application once every two years, whereas if you're doing a bark spray, you have to do it on an annual basis. So with that being said, if you do have this on your property, look to the surrounding trees, the trees you know you wanna protect, and then go ahead and inject those and they'll be protected for two years while this tree is odds are dying out. And remember, we do have quarantines on sudden oak death. Uh, so we should not be moving any of that material off the property. By all means, don't stack it up next to another oak tree. Uh, don't put it near a water source where it can be carried with water because that is one of the easiest ways for this uh, to move. Um, those oomyces spread so incredibly easily, especially with moisture. So keep that in mind. That's one of the, the reasons why we're always desperately trying to stop the spread of this. We know we can't stop the spread of it. Um, and, and honestly, that's one of the biggest issues uh, that we're having with this fires in the Santa Cruz Mountains is all of our dead tan oaks from this because there's so many of them. So it, it is one of those issues where you want to get it before it spreads too far. If it's on your property, you want a management or your customer's property, but it is something you can manage. Usually for the larger trees, 20 inch in diameter, we say automatically go to injection to get the good full dose in the tree to protect it. For the smaller, younger trees with thinner bark, just doing a bark spray application of it with petra bark uh, can protect the tree. So sudden oak death, we do our applications in fall. Um, and keep in mind, it's, it's one of those things, if you do injection, it's every two years. If it's bark spray, it's every year. Okay, and the last thing we've been getting on our oak trees is powdery mildew. Oh my gosh. This, you know, along with mites, powdery mildew has been a challenge this year. And um, there's a few ways we can handle it. Uh, one is we have a botanical spray called Eco One. It's an insecticide fungicide uh, combination of a 25B product, and it actually has curative properties. So if you have a minor infestation of powdery mildew, this is something you would spray on uh, and help eliminate the infestation. If you have a severe infestation, like pretty much everything's starting to turn white, uh, then you actually have to bump up and do a spray application of Copazol uh, to knock it down. But we try and get people to do a whole new approach to powdery mildew. It's kind of where we call thinking outside the box. Um, we've now realized with tree growth regulators, we have the ability to actually thicken up the cuticle of the leaves when they make them a little bit smaller. And it makes it so the fungal infections have a hard time adhering. So what we've been doing, we've been doing short stop applications on our trees to reduce the leaf size, to get that thicker cuticle so we don't get that fungal infection of powdery mildew. So it's more of a long game on that one because pretty much you have to do your fall applications for that right now. That's why I have the slide for powdery mildew in my fall presentation. Normally we're just spraying for it in spring and summer, but if you're going to get ahead of it, think about doing the short stop application. So you pretty much have to get that down and into the tree before the tree kind of goes into its kind of winter dormancy, which oaks aren't exactly that same way, but we got to get it early enough in our application period so that way it triggers a communication system inside the tree to say, hey, something's going on. We have to make our leaves a little bit smaller uh, and thicken up our cuticles. And so I'll kind of go into the chemicals that we apply in fall and I'll start with the short stop product. So short stop is one of those things that we tend to do in summer and fall. Um, fall is pretty much your last ditch effort. We don't tend to do uh, the plant growth regulators in spring because a communication has already happened throughout that tree. The tree already knows it's growing. It knows what buds it's gonna be shooting. It knows how it's gonna be growing. So we need to get to that tree before that communication system starts. And so that's how we get to alter it. So uh, Shortstop is, is a Paclobutrazole product. 
Um, it's applied every two years, so don't do it every year. You'll get Disneyland looking weird trees. Um, but the way it's designed to work is it actually holds back the canopy. It shortens that inner node um, on the leaf. It's not an anti-fruiting, so don't accidentally use this to stop you know, fruit, produce, uh, fruit production. Sometimes this will actually create more fruit production. So if you've already got a problem tree, don't put this down, you'll just have a bigger problem. But it really does help alleviate some of the additional factors uh, on tree growth that can affect these fungal infections. So kind of the way it works is, my writing didn't show up, oh, for heaven's sakes. Well, at least the power is still on, right? So I'm gonna skip through these since the writing doesn't really help, but basically what they're talking about is how initially when we have a lot of the energy goes into growth, well, when we say, hey, we're gonna direct or redirect that energy into other aspects, one of the things it goes through is into the immune system, making fine root hairs, uh, and basically kind of protecting the tree. So that being said, you can see that photo on the bottom right. Uh, the one on the right was treated, the one on the left was not treated. And so it's a lot denser growth, and it's a, the leaves are a little bit smaller, and there looks a little darker green. That's part of that thickening of that cuticle, uh, which makes it more difficult for things like, you know, powdery mildew, rust, synthracnose to adhere to the leaf tissue. So uh, this is kind of what it looks like up close. Again, you see the smaller leaves, shorter nodes, thicker cuticles. So it works for things such as uh, chlorosis as well, drought, which, wow, we seem to be having some issues with that again in Northern California. So don't hesitate to think out the box and start using these plant growth regulators. Uh, this was a, an issue where it was being used uh, for micronutrients and drought. Um, you can see they actually went ahead, did a micronutrient boost as well as using the shortstop. Uh, and that's how well the tree was able to recover. And you can see they really haven't done much to the soil because that poor turf still looks the same. <laughs> it's solely what was applied uh, to the tree that's caused this uh, reaction. So keep that in mind. You get a much nicer, denser, rounder canopy from this. So you can see on this photo, the one on the left was not treated, the one on the right was. And you can see how just by reducing the amount of canopy, it can better distribute some of those micronutrients, keep it greener, healthier, and then also it, it stops the amount of pruning you technically need to do. So if you guys have questions about shortstop, please don't hesitate to ask me about it. There's lots of Various uses for it that we never thought of before. When we started using shortstop, it was solely for drought reasons. We were trying to hold back that canopy and grow those roots during our big drought period. And, and from that, we learned a lot more uh, beneficial uses to using these plant growth regulators. So feel free to contact me with any questions you might have, or if you wanna do a demonstration of this product, I always enjoy doing those with this one as well. So the other chemicals that we use during the fall is basically our nutrients. We like to do nutrients in the fall. Um, and partly it's because sometimes we put in high amounts of micronutrients that can sometimes cause somewhat marginal burning in high temperatures uh, and on trees that have already been chlorotic. So for instance, you see this photo down here on the left, bright yellow leaves. Well, if we were to go ahead and give that a nutrient boost, uh, those leaves are very tender because they don't have all the nutrients to fortify and protect themselves. So what happens is you usually end up getting burning effects on those new tender tissue. So that being said, we like to do our nutrient applications in the fall. So we have our MinJet and our PalmJet. This was the MinJet application. This one was done in spring. And I always show this photo because you can do it in spring, but it's really touch and go. So the one on the left got the treatment, the one on the right. Notice at the bottom, this was only three weeks after treatment. So when the treatment was actually done, this tree did not have any leaves on it. It was just buds. So when the buds popped, you can see it utilizes the nutrients on the left and the one on the right clearly didn't have it. But if I had waited and done this application when it had little tiny leaves, I would have blown all those leaves off just by putting too much micronutrients into tender tissue. So that being said, if you can thread that needle and get it right at bud expansion without leaf pop, you can do it in spring. But that's why I always recommend doing these applications in fall. You don't wanna risk it. <laughs> so this was an application done in November. Yeah, that was one of those Hail Mary trees. Like, sure, we'll, we'll see if we can give it some micronutrients and save it. Um, and sure enough, that was the, the big main issue with these trees in this parking lot was they're really old trees. You can see by the diameter, they've been pruned hard year after year, and they had just really run out of micronutrients to fortify themselves. So this was just one application done. You can see what it looked like in 2017 and then what it looked like again in 2018. So again, fall applications are best. Palm jet 
we like to do our palm applications in fall or spring. Um, and then once again, that's because of hot temperatures. We don't ever want to be treating our palm trees when it's above 80 degrees. They have very little canopy up there. So when we put product in to a palm tree, it goes in and up the vascular bundles to the new growth, only the new growth. When you're treating palm trees, the chemical doesn't go out to the old fronds. So those old fronds are gonna be yellow, they're gonna stay yellow. That chemical is gonna to go to the new fronds and make them green and healthy. And then as the old fronds drop down, you can prune them off. Don't prune them off before they drop below that 45 because they're still giving nutrients to the new fronds. Um, but that being said, we like to do these in fall. Uh, and if you're working with any sort of fusarium treatments, again, we like to do those in fall. Uh, that's when we want to get the trees start or the palms starting to fortify themselves when it's cooler temperatures. Uh, we don't necessarily want to be going after these guys in, in late spring or summer where it's hot and we can get that uh, frond burn from it because they don't have enough fronds as it is that they can afford to burn any off. So uh, take the time, look, see what's going on with your palm to identify what the real issue is. Um, honestly, iron is very common, but when it comes to palms, uh, the whole manganese is an even bigger issue. So I find it ironic our water system has a hard time pulling manganese out, yet we need more manganese for our palms. So uh, keep that in mind. It's not necessarily a nitrogen reason why we're, we're giving palms fertilizer. It's not really iron usually. It's usually falling more into the manganese issue. And every now and again, we run into boron. Uh, this is a photo of boron deficiency on the bottom right. Just so you know, boron toxicity looks identical. So if you really do see that type of damage, by all means, get a soil test and see what you're really dealing with. Uh, and I just had a great example of seeing uh, herbicide damage that looked very similar to boron deficiency slash toxicity. So keep that in mind when dealing with palms, their, their fronds are basically a roadmap of what they need. So take a close look. If you have any questions, feel free, send me a photo, I'm happy to help. And then last but not least for fertilizers, we have uh, our new addition our, to our Arbor RX program is our Arborplex. And this is our, uh, uh, our NPK fertilizer for trees. So it seems like a high end, but notice that it is a 50% slow release. So it's one of those things that you're going to get the release over time. So you'll see it all season. We prefer to do applications in fall. We don't necessarily want to do a strong push come spring. They're already doing their natural growth. So a lot of times if you do a spring application, you see their natural growth and then you get a bolt on it. And all of a sudden you got like two feet of new growth and it's just waving in the wind. And it actually kind of makes the tree look a little distorted. So we like to do the applications in fall. It lets them absorb, fortify, and then use what they need to, uh, to better supply themselves come spring when they relief out uh, or put on their new growth. So that's the reason why this is in the fall application as well. So I know people do fertilization all throughout the year at different times, uh, but ideally we like to look to fall. Okay. And just a few tips for injecting in fall. It's our standard measure, drill, plug, inject. Uh, nothing really changes there. The only real difference you're gonna find is that you're gonna see movement uh, a little bit slower up the tree. And that's because during this time of year, a lot of the uh, sugars are coming down through the phloem of the tree and going down and fortifying into the roots. So sometimes uh, you gotta make sure you have good uptake and the tree isn't overwatered. Say over water because this is the time of year we do start getting some of our rain, hopefully soon. Um, but that being said, sometimes trees can be oversaturated and it can be difficult to get the product in. So keep that in mind with your fall applications. If you have gotten a lot of rain and they're being irrigated, have them pull off, pull back on the irrigation so you can do the uh, injection application. That being said, uh, I like to talk about the fact that there's three different systems that we have. That IV system is great for fall applications because like I said, it takes a little bit longer. This system, you can just set up on the tree, let it slowly do its work while you're working on to the next tree. The quick jet is a little harder to work with in fall because you are manually kind of fighting getting that product in sometimes. Uh, so you might want to bump up to that quick jet air where the air pressure is actually just pushing it in for you. So, and that, that's something you'll find as you get later and later into the season. Uh, and trees might be starting to form more of their decision layers, might be dropping more of their leaves, so they have less translocation going on, and therefore it might be harder to start getting the product into the tree. So just be aware of that. Um, and I also wanted to mention that we still have the compressors available. 
uh, for anyone who is still having issues finding air because of the whole COVID shutdown. Uh, sorry about that. It was one of those unexpected things. So, you know, it's one of those things. Necessity is the mother of invention, right? So we're working on it. And then uh, in the fall, we always recommend using the plugs. And partly it's because of that back pressure of the phloem, uh, sugars coming down the phloem. You're gonna find a lot more weeping wanting to occur on trees in the fall. So if you drill into the tree and you just do an injection without the plug, you're gonna find you're gonna get more weeping at that site. Whereas if you use the plug, it's gonna help protect that phloem layer and you're not gonna have that issue of that weeping as badly. So just be aware of that. And anytime you're working with conifers, we like to do our conifers in fall, use the plugs. You really can't get to conifer well without using the plug system. It is incredibly difficult to get that full dose into the tree without using that plug system. So just make sure if you're using the plug, set that whole plug below that bark layer, right? Just like that. Don't leave anybody hanging out in the bark. You're, you're gonna have that plug just push right back out and the tree's not gonna nicely seal it right in. So I always talk about that. And then last but not least, because it is systemic and because we don't know what winter is going to do, make sure the tree has water. So if you're starting your applications now for anthracnose, and of course we are dry, 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 make sure you water the tree first. Do your application and then give it some more water at the back end to make sure it's really moving up and circulating through the tree before our rain. I don't recommend starting to do our oak trees until we get our first rain. So that's the reason why we say start October 1. Usually the first week of October, we start to get some rain or moisture events and the oaks start to kind of wake up and come out of their summer dormancy. So that being said, make sure there's water and uh, don't just rely on rain. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's not a reliable source anymore. And then last, if you're gonna take the time to water that tree, add in the Nutri-Root. Um, a lot of people, guys out there, I know you're using this now, and it really has been a huge advantage for a lot of these trees. The humates and humectants in it help hold that water in the root zone so it doesn't wick away to the other surrounding dry soil. And then all the amendments we put in, such as the kelp and the micronutrients uh, and the foss, it really helps fortify that tree. So if you have a stress tree um, or a drought stress tree or a tree going through construction or transplant, by all means, uh, get a pro get one of the little tiny bottles of this, give it a shot. You'll see a remarkable difference. Um, it's definitely worth investing the time and a couple extra dollars into each application to use this as a drench. So if you're gonna take the time to water your tree, by all means, add this in. And since I am running quickly out of time, uh, I always put in my slide, enter to win. So review, uh, say, hey, wow, she had a couple slides messed up. Not like her, what's going on? Sorry, just got back in the house on Friday. <laughs> but we kept power the whole time, so I feel this was a win. But please go ahead, do the survey, give any feedback. We're, we're always looking for uh, information to improve information for you guys. And then of course, we'll send you whatever you prefer, D tape, hat, something of that nature as a thank you. And that is my presentation for today. So that's my contact information. If you guys like a demonstration of any of these, by all means, I'm happy to get out of the house. Uh, so uh, give me a call and uh, I can come out and do demos and show you products and how things work. Um, but right now I'm going to go through and look at the questions that we might have. Um, I don't think I have any questions.